returning to the storage room and climbing down the wooden ladder from the trap door above, we reached a short hallway, rounded a corner and entered another large chamber, dimly lit by a variety of soft magical lights. Given the dozen or so crude bunk beds and cots lining the wall here as well as some bedrolls on the ground, it looked like we had entered a barracks. As we turned the corner, we almost crashed into the well-dressed officials who had just escaped from us a short time ago, the half dozen or so men and women fleeing from an open doorway to the south. We surrender. The leader cried, terror in his voice. Please, save us. Several of the officials pointed back toward the southern doorway. There, 30 feet away, stood a dozen low-level male and female guards, fighting something on the other side of the doorway, I couldn't tell what, but I sensed it was something large and monstrous. You are adventurers. Another of the officials yelped, quite frightened. Do something. Go. Nira ordered. I will stay behind and make sure they don't escape. Dashing toward the southern entrance, we quickly joined the rookie fighters, some of them bravely standing their ground but most essentially cowering in terror. Moments later, a giant claw reached into the doorway from beyond and grabbed one of the men, the soldier screaming in sudden pain and panic as the monstrosity quickly removed him and, likely, devoured him. Whatever was attacking, it was massive and quite deadly. We can help. S. Wynn called out, looking about. What's going on? Recognizing a much stronger and more experienced group of heroes among them, the rookie soldiers withdrew back into the barracks, placing our party on the battlefront. Just beyond the doorway was another vast chasm, likely the same one we had encountered when dealing with the bridge earlier in the quest. A small group of giant crabs and snails had slithered their way through the chasm and into the barracks here, I counted at least three corpses lying amongst the monsters, victims who were either too slow or too drunk to escape the surprisingly quick creatures. Where did those come from? Redfern shouted, looking about. Probably from the shoreline to the east, Ariana responded, readying her weapons. Take them out. S. Wynn commanded, leading my heroes into battle against the giant creatures. Engaging the monsters, we suddenly faced five giant crabs and four giant snails. The giant crabs naturally resembled the ordinary variety but were much larger, averaging five feet in diameter, not including their legs. The giant snails were great molluscoid creatures with a hard shell covering most of their body. They attacked by slamming themselves into us and using their poisonous mucus to try and paralyze us for a half hour or so. Given their relatively large size and the distance between them and us, several of my heroes retrieved an orb of alchemists' fire from their packs and hurled the bombs, blasting the closest monsters and setting them on fire. The attacks and overwhelming success, we soon rendered the monstrosities unconscious, the giant crabs and snails falling back into the bottom of the chasm beyond where their carcasses caused several large splashes in the distance. Are they, dead? A timid voice came from behind. Turning around, we found the small party of officials standing about ten feet away, Nira carefully guarding them. Indeed, she had already done her job, each of the characters had their hands tied behind their backs and were no danger to us. Thank you, whoever you are, one of the women offered, seemingly grateful. It's what we do. Ariana boasted, her elvish grin helping to melt the ice here. Perhaps introductions are in order, the lead male human exclaimed, stepping forward. I am Bailey Lockwin and I've been leading the men and women here since Lodi's disappeared. This is Havana Laurel, our expert in magic. Kermit Highgrass who manages our armory. Ogerina Hastings who advises us on everything spiritual, and D.A.R. Hagatha, our primary contact with our spies in EAA. Bailey looked to be an adept fighter and I was glad that he had fully surrendered. Indeed, my initial impression was that these leaders seemed not just competent but honorable as well, not overtly wicked, selfish, or bent on destruction. You're the Emerald Crown I've heard about, Nira continued, not happy with the officials. All of you will hang for what you've done. We knew what we were getting ourselves into, Havana responded, not apologetic in the least. Men should have the same rights as women here in Genland, just as women should have the same rights elsewhere. What's going on here in EAA is a travesty and needs to be corrected. And who are you to doubt Queen Delpana and centuries of tradition? Nira questioned, the guard captain growing angrier by the moment. The genders are meant to work together, Ogerina answered rather elegantly. This approach to letting only women immigrate to Genland and not allowing men to peacefully coexist here is not only nonsense, it's damaging our culture, our future, and our way of life. This horrific sexism must end. Men ruin everything they touch. Nira argued, unwilling to compromise. 
We tried being more, open, to men in the past, but every time they would break our trust, taking what didn't belong to them, demeaning female superiors, even trying to claim this beautiful country for themselves. In the end, Delpana had no choice but to ban them from Ginland permanently. Evil and selfishness isn't just a man thing, Havana responded, her voice relatively calm. Just as a woman can do anything a man can, some women are just as wicked and self-serving as the worst of men. Not here in Ginland. Nira retorted. Here, all of us are equal, all of us love and respect our fellow sisters, and all of us see how important it is to live and work together. We have a utopia here and we don't need any men to destroy that. I can respect your point of view, Kartha said to Nira, surprising me. Perhaps we should just agree to disagree, nobody needs to die over this. Treason is a capital offense everywhere throughout Mariga, Nira returned to Kartha. Plotting against Queen Delpana and attempting to destroy our very way of life must be punished by death. You'll then just make martyrs out of them and further champion their cause, Kartha responded, shaking her head. You have to give the men here a chance to redeem their reputation and allow them back into your society. That will never happen. Nira cried, her anger starting to be directed toward my party. I have never met an honest, honorable man, we will never allow them into our society again. That's enough. S. Wind shouted, visibly angry. I take that comment personally. To everyone's surprise, S. Wind dismissed the magic around himself, revealing the man he truly was. Red Fern looked about, then followed suit, as did Sainayers a few moments later. Nira's jaw nearly dropped to the floor but the five captured leaders smiled and even bowed, demonstrating their support. Nicely done. Bailey said with a smile. Then you understand our cause here in Ginland. Yes, but I respect Nira and her point of view as well, I responded, trying to remain tolerant to all the ideas and beliefs being discussed. We recognize that sexism is wrong no matter which gender you're referring to, Kartha added, addressing everyone. But Queen Delpana still has the right to lead her country in the way she deems fit, we're not going to interfere with that. I can't condone what you've done, Nira continued. But all of you have proven yourselves, maybe there are a few good men out there. Why the charade? We never meant to deceive or dishonor you or all the sisters here in Ginland, Kartha continued. We're only here because an inner circle representative sent us to find her lost father. We think all of you have heard of him, an old wizard named Lodice, Red Fern offered. Lodice secretly assembled the Emerald Crown almost a year ago, Bailey replied. He had money, power, strength, and an odd fascination with Queen Delpana. He agreed to help us overthrow the government here in Ginland, Ogerina continued. But nobody was to be harmed, especially Delpana. In some strange way, we think he saw her as a victim, Havana added. It was like he needed to rescue her, or something. But we haven't seen him now in over a season, ever since. Kermit commented, abruptly ending his sentence. The firebombing of the power tower, Nira continued, recognizing where the conversation was going. Over a dozen were killed, including my predecessor. That wasn't us, the thief D.A.R. replied. We heard what happened, but we didn't do it. Lodice did it, Nira continued, surprising everyone. We found him amidst all the destruction, his ring of fire resistance saved him from being burned to death along with the others. He claimed it was an accident, but Queen Delpana still had him cast into the disposal pit, he's dead now. A collective gasp was let out, everyone but Nira sorry to hear of the fate of Lodi's. Lodi's would not have purposely hurt anyone, Havana finally said with a low voice. There must be another explanation to what happened. It does not matter, Nira countered, growing weary of the conversation. Now that all of you are in my custody, it's my duty to return you to EAA for judgment. The five rebel leaders looked at me, hoping I could say something, anything, to help their situation. They won't get a fair trial, I said to Nira, shaking my head. Is there any way we can speak to the Queen? Somewhat surprisingly, Nira seemed to consider my plea, responding in a slightly apologetic tone. The rebel leaders are coming back with me no matter what, Nira replied, her mind made up. But I will explain the situation to Queen Delpana and ask her to spare their lives, given the circumstances. Most of us nodded and gently smiled, thankful that Nira was apparently willing to show at least a little mercy. I think it's best that I take these rebels back myself, Nira then added, about to depart. Given the, men, in your party, it's best you remain on your own. Let's go, rebels. Several of the leaders looked to me, a combination of fear and acceptance. 
Nira then ordered them forward and quickly they marched out through the northern entrance leading into the barracks, likely to never be seen again. That, could have gone better, Ariana commented. Now what? We need to speak to Delpana ourselves, Kartha replied, urgency in her voice. We don't want to start a civil war, but we need to at least try to save the rebel leaders. But what if Nira exposes us? Sainayers asked logically. She knows who we are now. Well have to risk that, Kartha insisted, convinced of the right thing to do. Maybe she will even put in a good word for us. Yes, in my heart I knew Kartha was right, that our party needed to return to EAA and at least try to save the lives of the rebel leaders. It would be challenging, but there was a lot at stake here. First things first, Sainayers interjected. All of us are wounded and I am out of spells. We need to rest first, then attempt a rescue. Our other two spellcasters Kartha and Redfern agreed, and we found a comfortable place within the barracks to unpack, set up camp, rest, and recover for the next 8 to 10 hours or so. The next morning, we quickly departed the rebel mine and made our way back to EAA, arriving shortly before noon. Reaching the palace chamber again, our third time here, Delpana sat in her throne waiting for us. Nira stood alongside her, while several dozen guards stood about as well. The cosmetic magic disguising the men in my party now dispelled, S. Win, Sainayers and Redfern tried to cloak themselves in the back and remain out of sight. And, at first at least, the approach seemed to work. Well done. Queen Delpana shouted as we entered, standing to her feet. Well done. The rebel faction is no more, and they all await their fate at the gallows. I am so proud of all of you. Taking a few steps toward the party, only a moment passed before Delp Hannah recognized the men in the back, her eyes enlarging as far as they could go. Nira. The queen erupted, horrified. Are these... men? What's going on? These heroes lied to us from the start, the guard captain responded, stepping alongside Delp Hannah. The men here were magically altered to appear as our sisters to infiltrate us. The queen understandably shocked and speechless, I wisely decided to not rebuke Nira's claim. Everything we had done to this point had been a lie, so it was time to tell the truth and move forward. Guilty as charged I am afraid, but we can explain. How very disappointing, the queen finally stated, heartbroken and unwilling to hear me out. This changes everything. Guards. Now recognizing why all the guards were here, Nira had intended to expose us as soon as we returned, I watched as the guards surrounded our party, preventing any escape. Men, always ruining everything, Delpana spat, as disappointed as she was angry. Queen Delpana, let us explain, Kartha called out, attempting to salvage the situation. We had good reason to betray your trust. Silence, sister. The queen demanded, not willing to hear anything more. There is but a single penalty for trespassing within Genland with or as men, death. To the gallows, then, my queen? Nira asked, about to escort us all away. Is this what happened to Lodi's? Eswin boldly asked, not afraid to incur even more wrath from Delpana. Cocking her head for a moment, the queen slowly stepped to the warrior as if he were suddenly the only person in the chamber. What do you know of Lodi's? I know he came here looking for you, Eswin replied, his chin held high. I also know the firebombing outside the tower was an accident, he didn't mean to hurt anyone. Yet you still had him killed, didn't you? Lodice, my sweet, foolish, stubborn Lodice. Delpana whispered to herself, exposing sudden compassion. The queen turned away from us, strolling in silence to one of the many large vases holding dozens of her beloved white roses. She plucked one of the flowers and stared at it intensely, as if the rose held countless answers. If I didn't know better, I would have said that Delpana deeply regretted something she had done, and that she still had strong feelings for Lodice. For a moment, it even appeared that those feelings would rescue our party from a dark fate as well. Moments later, Queen Delpana suddenly buckled over in pain as if something were attacking her from within and Nira rushed to the side of Delpana, taking her hand. The older woman slowly straightened again, a mean, vengeful look on her face, I didn't know what had suddenly changed, but things now looked bleak for us. You want to know what happened to Lodi's? Why don't we show you? Nira, take them all to the disposal pit. Right away, my queen. The guard captain responded, turning in our direction. You heard the queen. Nira then shouted to all her armed guards. To the disposal pit with all of them. 
The guards all pounded their pole arms to the ground in acknowledgement of the captain's orders, then pointed their weapons at my party, pushing us toward the nearest spiral staircase. Upon being marched away from the power tower, we were quickly forced back to the disposal pit west of the tower, a small army of EAA guards preventing our party from doing anything rash. Recalling our visit here before, and the fact that anything thrown into the pit appeared to be teleported away with no chance of ever returning, our being led here felt quite ominous. Nira signaled to several of the closer guards and they, in turn, used their pole arms to push all of us to the very edge of the pit, its unnatural darkness five feet below quite unwelcoming. Ordinarily, I would allow the women here, Kartha and Ariana at least, to live, Nira commented, all of us standing near the pit to oblivion. But all of you are so man-tainted now that that's out of the question. Time to meet the same fate as Lodi's. Is this really what's best? Kartha demanded to know, her own scorn for Nira obvious. You know in your heart what you're doing is wrong. We admire your allegiance to Queen Delpana, but committing murder for no just reason? Aren't you all above that? Nira looked away, the words of Kartha making sense. For the record, we don't hate men, Nira responded in a softer, more respectful voice. But the law is the law, and I have my duty. I am sorry, Mutin, but this is the way it needs to be. Recognizing that nothing would change Nira's mind at this point, I accepted the hand that fate had dealt us, my entire party about to be teleported to who knows where and potentially ending our lives. If you do find Lodi's, warn him to never return, all of you. The guard captain instructed, hinting that perhaps our heroes would survive the encounter after all. Nira then nodded and the guards forced all of us into the pit, each of us falling for just a moment before everything went dark, our bodies teleported to some unknown location. And that's a wrap of episode number 31, Betrayal and Execution. Expect additional episodes every few weeks as the story continues.